before go uh, go ahead to the discussion i request our co organizer dr binod singh director brics institute india to offer a well uh, warm welcome to our panelist dr binod thank you very much ma'am uh, good afternoon good evening namaste assalam alaikum ni hao and dras vijay i have to use all these greetings because india is no more it's just watch it's not just we are watching this forum or our tv you know the whole world is watching us the way india is rising so we choose this topic india and west is i think two or three weeks back uh, we never thought that uh, the situation will become so toxic toxic that we have to in invite our patron our guardian honorable vc sir to come and control the situation at the mashur global forum so sir at the very outset we are very uh, feeling bold confident that we are able to invite you back to the campus uh, on behalf of the university of mysore ir department and so what we are going today is just a reflection of what's india is emerging in, in the global map and we have a very sensitive topic today which uh, i am not qualified to talk much and that's why we were again lucky enough that we have, our department has been guided by professor ak pasha who has been a veteran not only in 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 there in that part of india but again in jnu and the whole middle east in fact we have been born and brought up under his guidance so again we are not qualified to speak too much in front of him but again like what's happening right now is is not economic crisis not a political crisis it's a diplomatic crisis mes diplomatic war room is very active to control the fire in the middle east this is the first time i think after 1990s that india has become such a you know a controversial issue in the whole middle east i was advised by my colleague uh, madam bharti and others not to bring this topic uh, to discuss today what the topic i am referring is the controversy right now about india and india's some of the spokesperson of the ruling party giving some statement which is seen by the people and the friends in the middle east or the, i mean the west asia as we have crossed the lakshman rekha in our own language but sir at the same time we also believe in india as a you know vibrant and functional democracy that a healthy debate is always required in in hindi sometimes we say ek haath se taali nahi bajti so at this forum i think we are open to discuss certain aspects of how the things went out of control and how we can control the fire now and for this purpose uh, we have invited one of the most india's most i mean experienced and veteran uh, diplomatic scholar who you know who has served across the globe and who speaks the languages in different countries especially russian who is also a kind of you know fellow genuine from jawaharlal nehru university just like honorable professor pasha his name is none other than ambassador anil jigonuyat and before coming to this forum sir i really saw some of his videos where he is trying to pacify the fire you know to cool down the atmosphere the damage we have done by speaking too much little bit over confident you know about the rise of india india has been a very peaceful power in asia in the world we have been looking east and west equally and we have been the most respectful to all the religions in the world but sir so today there is a new india emerging there is a powerful india you know we are call it india emerging as a major power no doubt in different fields sir. but again at the same time we need your guidance your um, your wisdom to guide us so that we don't get out of control and that's why today's topic although it is titled india's energy security in the west asia but we cannot avoid the hiding part is that people to people contact is very important you know despite we are doing business in petro dollars and oil but people to people contact between india and west asia is so important that more than 8 million indians are right now based in arab world so one statement which has gone wrong from our side can you know put them in danger so we should always keep in mind that you know for a long time in the independent india arab world west asia has been a very balancing player and the kind of relationship we shared with them for the last 5000 years where is arabic number which they took it to the world you know and now they call it arabic number but it was invented by india so like this they have been the middle man in the east and west they have taken indian culture to the west and they have brought western culture to india it's very hard to distinguish where is you know uh, where is the arabic culture where is the indian culture in our sweets in our clothing in our bollywood movies 
And even sir, I believe you can guide us in science and technology also. There's a lot we have learned from each other and we have peacefully coexisted. Whether it was Gulf War, Iraq War, or whether it is latest Russian and Ukraine War, I think India has always promoted peace and diplomacy and dialogue in all the countries. We have never chosen a side, whether it is Western Bank and Gaza conflict, one of the lo longest living conflict in the world. Uh, we have not sided in the Shia Shoni conflict. We have maintained very balanced and equal people to people and cultural relationship with all the Gulf, these West Asian countries. And people like Professor A.K. Pasha and diplomat like Ambassador Anil, they have worked very hard. And right now they feel angry what we are doing. So at this forum, we want them to guide us how things can be controlled, how it should not be you know, exaggerated. And uh, at the same time, I have to make some disclaimers that any opinion made on this platform today, it has to be individual. It, it will not represent the idea of, or thinking of Mysore Global Forum. Mysore Global Forum is purely a, an academic forum meant for the students and faculty of IR department, which is a young department sir, for the last uh, five, six years approved by you when you were the vice chancellor and guided by Professor A.K. Pasha, who was the board of the member. We were lucky to contact Ambassador Anil Tigunyad because he is very humble. He is very humanitarian. He has been guiding our MEA you know, in rescue operations in many parts of the world. And again, right now, although he is not directly serving in the MEA, but the way he is active with his uh, philosophy, with his approach towards how India should handle the current situation, you know, in a very you know, dilemma that we have, you know, we have certain uh, questions with the radical Islam, with the terrorism, the way they have been funded by some of the regimes, which I can't name here. But at the same time, we have to walk the tight rope here. So without further delay, I'll just repeat once again that this forum is meant to create peace and amity and harmony between the civilizations and culture. We are not a political forum or, or you know, some wing of some party. So uh, before I hand over the session to uh, Honorable Moderator, uh, Professor Bharti Hiremat, who has taken a big courage to choose this topic, approve this topic, and sir, so invite you to bless us, to guide us, that how Masur as a very historical place in, in, in India, as, as a place of science and technology, as a place of India's culture can play an important role in India's rise, in the rise of India. I, I take your permission, I take break here, and I really apologize if I have made any extra statement on any topic. So Madam, the floor is yours. And I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, name all the individuals because my colleagues at the University of Mashur, they have prepared a very uh, good, well-prepared welcome remarks, which will follow next. So thank you very much for your precious time. And we look forward for a great interaction today uh, from Ambassador Anil Trigoniat and also Professor A.K. Pasha and uh, Professor Gorda also. So we are all students of yours and we look forward to see a new idea, a new, new India, a new diplomacy, whether it is East or West. We all want to go for the same foreign policy, peaceful foreign diplomacy. So thank you very much, ma'am. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Binod. We all know that India's two-third oil imports relies on GCC countries. Recently, Indian government has taken a challenging decision to expand its renewable, renewable energy to 500 gigawatt by 2030. Also, India has taken uh, uh, many programs to, to implement and to promote oil resources in India. In this regard, uh, in this regard, India is continuously trying to make itself self-reliant in coming days. In this regard, today we have uh, outstanding practitioners and uh, dynamic uh, academicians and dynamic personalities to discuss on India's energy security and West Asia. Sir, we have a pro formal procedure to introduce our guest and panelists. Now, I request Ms. Renuka Hiramar to introduce our uh, former Vice Chancellor, Professor K. S. Rangappa and Dr. Apaji Gauda on the behalf of uh, BRICS Institute India and the Department of International Relations. Ms. Renu, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Renuka Hiramad. Sir, 
I am really blessed today to introduce an outstanding personality like you. And indeed, it is difficult for me to put all your achievements in limited slot, but I'll try my best, sir. <laughs> Respected Professor K. S. Rangappa, sir, has been Vice Chancellor for two universities, Karnataka State Open University and University of Mysore, Mysuru. Sir has made novel and significant contributions to chemical biology drug discovery program, bioorganic and medicinal chemistry. His most important contributions have been towards the synthesis of new molecules for various therapeutic areas. Over 5,000 new bioactive molecules have been synthesized from his laboratory, which was tested for their antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, anti-malarial, and against Alzheimer's disease. Apart from research activities, Sir has developed several Indo-Japan, Indo-French, Indo-UK, Indo-US, Indo-Russia, and many more collaborative research programs with more than 300 scientists working across the globe. Sir is the fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, UK, fellow of National Academy of Sciences, and fellow of Indian Science Congress Association. He has received many awards and is visiting professor in several universities abroad. Professor Rangappa has 11 patents and has successfully guided 55 PhD candidates. He has been appointed as a chief scientific advisor at Sinota Pharmaceutical Company Limited. He is the general president for 107th Indian Science Congress. His perseverance and hard work inspires many. Sir, you are a living inspiration to many of us. Once again, a warm welcome to you. I extend my welcome to respected Dr. Apaji Goda, sir. He has been chairman of board of studies in Department of Anthropology, KSOU. He has also been member of board of studies in Department of International Relations, Department of Sociology, and many more. Sir is life member at Indian Science Congress Association. His area of interest is tribal development, and his field of research is lifestyle of people around KRS Dam due to Kaveri River water reservoir. His pioneering spirit and willingness is an inspiration to many of us. We are privileged to have you here with us, sir. I welcome you both to the panel discussion. Uh, thank you for gracing Mysore Global Forum. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Enika, for giving a wonderful introduction of our today's guest. Now I request uh, Professor K. Srangappa, former uh, Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore and uh, Karnataka State Open University. <coughs> sir, over to you, sir. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, particularly Ambassador Anil, uh, former Ambassador of India to Libya, and distinguished fellow of Vivekananda International Foundation. And uh, good old friend, Professor A.K. Pasha, uh, Director and Chairman of SIS JNU and very young and bright Dr. Binod Singh, who is the director of BRICS Institute, India, Dr. Bharati Hiremat, Dr. Apaji Goda, and many participants of this Mysore Global Forum organized this seminar on India's energy, security, and West Asia. At the outset, I'm extremely happy to be associated with this Mysore Global Forum, which is a new, uh, new uh, forum, which can, uh, somebody should support, including myself, to come up uh, as the director Vinod Singh mentioned, the BRICS Institute is collaborating with this Mysore Global Forum is a very encouraging matter. No, I'm extremely happy. I've been associating with this Mysore Global Forum for the last several months. You know, India is setting up a web of energy relationships in the extended neighborhood, covering Myanmar, Vietnam in the East, with Central Asian countries like uh, Kazakhstan and Gulf countries in the West major transformations are underway in global energy sector from growing electrification uh, to the expansion of renewable energy 
of heaven in oil production and globalization of natural gas markets. India needs to build its capacity in research and skills building to deal with these transformations in energy sector. Challenges like carbon emissions, air pollution, and energy access outlines different possible future scenario for the energy security. The dynamic scenarios foreseen by India energy security scenarios 2047 should guide the policy makers in the energy sector. India needs to ensure long-term planning to ensure universal energy access and meeting its commitment under Paris Agreement to ensure sustainable and inclusive growth. The post-independent India has strategic interests in West Asia. The Gulf states supply the bulk of India's oil and natural gas, host large diasporas, promote trade and investment, and engage in security and intelligence cooperation. For decades, the relationship between India and the Gulf has been defined by oil. However, for firmer influence, the country is ready to its interest in West Asia beyond oil and gas. India imports 53% of its oil and 41% of its gas from West Asia, and over 8.5 million Indians work work in the region. Energy trade is the anchor of India-West Asia economic relations, but the trade basket needs to be diversified, especially due to the Wuhan virus and the fail and the fall in energy demands. Goods like precious metals, food, agriculture products, chemicals, gems, and jewelry textile must all be included in the trade basket. A senior official from India's Ministry of External Affairs said India and the girl can explore for doing of partnerships to develop oil and gas reserves in various parts of the country. India is expanding cooperation and has agreed to further strengthen you know, Behran, India, ties in the areas of defense and maritime security, space technology, trade and investment, infrastructure, aid, fin tech health, hydrocarbon and re renewable energy. Although India has tried to maintain a relatively neutral stance in West Asia, connectivity with West Asia is strategically important for India to remain stable in terms of its energy consumption and security. And I'm sure today the esteemed panel will discuss India's energy security with West Asia. Hopefully we can have an effective and insightful discussion which might bring forth the key frames of India in maintaining the strong relations with West Asia in terms of energy security. With these, uh, uh, I take the opportunity to congratulate all of you to organize this kind of the you know activity, the India's energy security in West Asia, West Asia which everyone requires and needs. With these, I wish you all the success for this. Uh, uh, one day meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your good words and valuable uh, opening remarks uh, for uh, uh, today's panel discussion. Now, I request our student, Ms. Penal, to introduce our dynamic and uh, outstanding partitioner, uh, Ambassador Anil Triganath and Professor A.K. Pasha. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I am Pinal Trivedi, and I'm a student of the Department of International Relations. Good evening to one and all present here. 
it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk on the topic india's energy security and west asia our speaker ambassador anil trigunath sir is a member of the indian foreign service he has served in the indian missions in cote d'ivoire bangladesh mongolia usa russia sweden nigeria libya and jordan he also served as director general joint secretary for the gulf and hajj divisions in the ministry of external affairs new delhi thereafter ambassador trigunath worked as deputy chief of mission in the rank of ambassador in the embassy of india moscow prior to his supranution in may 2016 he served as ambassador of india to jordan and libya and high commissioner to malta he is a post graduate in physics from the agra kumau university and also studied russian history culture and language at the jawaharlal nehru university new delhi he is a member of the all india management association delhi management association as well as that of oxford and cambridge society of india and the association of indian diplomats for, for former ambassadors he is the honorary member of the international trade council brussels he is also the honorary advisor to brics chamber of commerce ambassador trigunath sir is profound influence in french russian and spanish languages he is a peace ambassador with unity earth australia as well as a rotarian serving the society to the extent possible finally i would like to say sir it's my great honor to welcome you as an eminent person who has experienced a lot from all walks of life and have come here to guide us so on behalf of our department and one and all present here i i wholeheartedly welcome you sir also i would like to introduce our second speaker today professor a k pasha he is a former associate dean of school of international studies jawaharlal nehru university new delhi sir has been teaching at university level since 1984 and has over 15 years administrative experience as associate dean director and chairman in the university he has also served as diplomat in egypt for 3 years He holds MA degrees in Middle Eastern Studies and Political Science from Mysore University, MPhil and PhD in International Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has published over twenty-six books, self-authored, edited, and co-edited. He has published over hundred research articles in academic journals as well. He has successfully supervised over fifty MPhil and PhD dissertation and theses. His research, teaching, and writing is focused on West Asia and North Africa. He is on the editorial board of several international and national journals. He is a frequent commentator, analyst on international affair issues for radio and TV in India and abroad. He was Fulbright Professor Scholar at Saint Cloud State University, Minnesota, USA, during 2010. He has been visiting professor at several universities in India. His research interests and area of specialization include democratization in West Asia and North Africa, political spheres. Arab Israeli peace process comparative regionalism and linkages between West Asia and North Africa his most recent books are India and the Gulf region maritime history trade security and political reforms currently sir is serving as the director of center for India West India West Asia dialogue CIWAD finally i would like to say that it's my honor to welcome you sir as well So, on behalf of our department and one and all, I wholeheartedly welcome you, sir. Thank you, Miss Pia. Thank you, ma'am, for your beautiful introduction <laughs> of our today's panelist, sir. It is not enough to uh, talk about your personalities without taking much. I would like to say little about our panel discussion. In the era of increasing trade war and changing global order. it is very important in india to balance the relations with west asian countries and it is very important to increase to have an uh, you know it should very ensure energy security and also it is uh, very important to know that what is the quest for energy security and how india can balance the relations with west asian countries it may be a bilateral relation it may be a multilateral relation because in the era of this uh, you know competition we need to have a uh, balancing relations with west asian countries sir without taking much time i will leave the platform to you people sir 
and it is a very honor to us and our students uh, to listen your views and uh, information, uh, your experience in this field, sir. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Ambassador Anil, sir. Um, thank you, Professor Hiramat. And uh, thank you, Mr. Vedi, for that very kind introduction. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Rangappa, Professor Gora, Dr. Vinod Singh of the BRICS Institute, Mysore Global Forum. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be able to discuss with you certain dimensions of our relationship with West Asia, especially in the company of my very dear friend, Professor Pasha. You are all aware about the recent controversy that erupted between India and West Asian countries, especially from the Gulf region. It was an unnecessary controversy, but that shows that sometimes certain innocuous events can impact a perception in a particular relationship. But the fact that it has been duly addressed as a result of the government's continued, I would say, perseverance in maintaining excellent relations with the Middle East. And as you rightly mentioned, Professor, it is a relationship not of yesterday or today or tomorrow. It is a relationship which is connected through civilizations. Many of you may know that Oman used to have a very key, played a very key role in India going uh, to Europe and to elsewhere. We have historic civilization, whether it is Dilmun civilization in Bahrain. So the relationship at the P2P level, that is people to people level have always been there. If you are going to meet uh, many of the leaders in these regions, they will very fondly recall their connection with India before the oil was struck. Once they became oil rich, obviously it became a much greater field for geopolitical contestation. Earlier it was the British and then the Americans replaced them and then they came into the Cold War scenario. Finally, in the recent past and especially after the 1973 when we had the Yom Kippur War, that was the time that these countries learned how to use oil as their weapon. So when today we are talking of Russia using uh, oil as its weapon against the European and American uh, interests, we need to see that this is not something that is unique today. But this has gone on. At the same time, this region, as you know, possesses more than 40% of the hydrocarbon energy in the world. So it is extremely important. Whatever we may be doing today to substitute the hydrocarbons with the renewables, and as you mentioned earlier, India has uh, set great targets, and it's absolutely necessary to do so also. But at the same time, I do not think that within the next 30, 40 years, we are likely to wean away from the hydrocarbons. Because if we have to grow at eight to 10% in order to meet our targets and the aspirations of our youth, we will have to continue to use energy because without the energy, you cannot just move forward, whichever way we look at it. But a lot of this energy would be converted into renewables, uh, that is for sure, that's going to be there. And it's not only us. If you follow the region, you will realize that these countries themselves have started branching out towards the renewable domain. And it is not only uh, India which is doing it. India is doing it because 85% of our requirements we import from outside. And majority of it is now coming from the West Asian countries. And in fact, over the time that we have seen several incidents that have happened and had impacted us greatly. Because as you know, the majority of our imports 
are actually constitute mainly of the oil and gas. And therefore, it is important that we continue to export at the same time in order to offset the foreign exchange requirements. So oil is also a fungible commodity. It is not going to last forever. As we know that the Saudi Arabia, if it continues to pump as today's rate of 10.2 million barrels a day, it will have the oil for a maximum of 80 years. So that's the time frame that we are looking at it and it is the richest country in terms of oil. Some new finds may be there, but that's not there. We have seen what has happened to the Americans because see the geopolitics of oil has also changed a great deal. Earlier, the Americans were greatly dependent on the Middle East oil, but over time, they have become not only self-sufficient, but have also emerged as exporters of oil. And they are competing with the Middle East countries, even with India and elsewhere. So very often you will find that the Americans trying to cut into the same pie. But at the same time, their European allies or Asian allies, for example, Japan and South Korea, are also very quite dependent on the Middle East oil supplies. So they have to keep on looking at after their own interests in that sense. But we have seen that whenever the, there have been disruptions, whether in the region, or outside, oil has been impacted. Supply of oil has been impacted. The price of oil has been impacted. You remember that in, uh, I spoke about 73. Thereafter, we had the Iran-Iraq war. Then we had the Gulf Wars. Thereafter, we had the Arab Spring, even during that time. Then when you had the financial meltdown. And thereafter, you have now the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which has impacted. Now, for your information, in the last three, four months, we have paid more than $40 billion out of our foreign exchange reserves to buy the additional oil that we require because of the cost increases. So you can imagine if the oil prices go haywire, we are going to have a problem in our developmental paradigm, the growth of the economy. So only two days ago, the World Bank has brought down India's uh, GDP forecast for next year uh, to about 7.5% from 8.5%. So these are the things that are going to keep putting you at, the, at any given time in a very challenging position. So I feel that we need to have something as we have embarked on is called Aat Nirbhar. Now Aat Nirbhar, how does it become? It becomes through diversification, because if we are going to be part of the global and value supply chains, you can't live in an island. So you have to create your own capacities and competitiveness. At the same time, finding those partnerships which are reliable and dependable. Today, fortunately, our relations with all the Gulf countries and the Middle Eastern countries have been excellent, I would say. This is used to, earlier it used to be a transactional relationship as we used to call it. For example, you buy the oil, you pay for it. You had the Indians working there, they will be sending their remittances, their employees. But it has changed over time. And as was mentioned earlier, it has gone into the defense of their strategic area. And it is not only for our own interest, it is for their interest as well. Because India has turned into the largest market in the world, it's going to be. And even today, it is the second largest market. There is a better rate of return for their investment. So they're investing. As we are talking, there is a greater investment coming into from Saudi Arabia, from UAE, from Qatar, from Kuwait, from Bahrain, from all these countries, into the oil and gas sectors and other areas of our investment. So what does this investment do? This investment creates the stakeholdership of their interest into India. And I would say that this has played out extremely well. How our relationship a few years ago, let's say about 10 years back, was still predicated on their relationship with Pakistan. Every time something happened, they said they are very close to Pakistan because of Islam, because of this, that, all kinds of stuff. This has changed. These key countries thought that Article 370 abrogation, or for that matter, the uh, Balakot and Pulawama strikes and all those, they were all part of India's internal response system. This was never to be done before. It never happened before. 
every time all these used to get up. They also do not comment on your internal matters unless a situation like the <clears throat> last week or 10 days ago happens. It has not happened, but they understood India's position. And so I see that our relationship with this country is extremely important. And I also continue to maintain that in some ways, our extended neighborhood comprising of Gulf countries in the Middle East is even more important than your immediate neighborhood for your energy security, for your food security, for your fertilizer security, for your diaspora security, for your remittances. The remittances coming from the Gulf constitute nearly 10% of your overall foreign exchange at this stage. It's extremely important for us. So whatever we do here in our country, we need to be mindful of the impact it will have on our relationship there. The maritime security, the maritime lanes are so very important for trade, for flow of oil and gas and everything. And there is going to be a competition in there. China is going to be our biggest challenge in the region. They're already spreading around quite a bit. And so we'll have to continue to work together. We have to find. Now what we have done, we have diversified our, you know, we import oil and gas from 41 countries, not from, from Africa, from Latin America. But the key problem that we face today is the unilateralism of the United States. They come up with some sanctions that is called CATSA, which are secondary sanctions. We used to import nearly 21% of our oil from Iran and Venezuela. We had to bring it down to zero because of those US sanctions. Now you can imagine if you are going to cut off your nearly one quarter of your supplies from certain countries because of a third country's actions, how are you going to move forward? Where do you replace the oil from? So that's the kind of challenges that one faces. So we have started now creating reserves in India. And in that, the UAE, the Saudi Arabia, the Qatar, all these countries are investing a great deal. Today, we have been able to, whatever I understood is, that we have something about 30, 35 days worth of reserves, which at one time, you know that President Biden asked all the countries to release the reserves. Just a two minutes I'll take on our Russia thing. Now, you know, the basic purpose of the foreign policy is to serve your own in national interest. First and primary task is that for the foreign policy. So if I can buy oil from somewhere, be it Russia or elsewhere, at a much cheaper price, why would I, not, why, why would I be denied that? And that's precisely the reason that despite the objections of the Americans and the Western countries who deal only in hypocrisy, they're buying themselves, but at the same time, they deny you that right, even to buy a very small percentage. But what India has done, I just read somewhere that RIL, the Reliance Petroleum, have imported nearly 15 million barrels from uh, Russia. And Russia is giving you a huge discount. So when the prices are above $105, $110, Another country gives you 30% discount, only a fool will not buy. So that's what is important. While it is your staple diet, frankly, for your industry. So therefore, what I say is that India's strategic autonomy, as the foreign policy today is called, is very much into play, into an action. And when we talk from the position of strength, when we talk from the position of principles, then we hold out in the world, in that sense. So I'll be very happy to answer any questions, but I'll stop there because my friend, Professor Pasha, will be uh, throwing greater light on many other things. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Anil, sir, for your valuable and thought-provoking uh, views on India's relations with West countries. And uh, truly, as you told, uh, for India, it is very much important to balance a very good relations with West Asian countries rather than neighborhood, neighborhood countries, because India is required to have a sustainable energy. Without taking much time, we need one more, uh, another outstanding personality, highly experienced in West Asian countries. Sir, uh, uh, Professor Pasha, sir, over to you, sir. We want to listen to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hiremet, uh, uh, for this uh, opportunity. Can you hear me? Sure. Hello? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. We are hearing you, sir. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, let me uh, make a few uh, remarks uh, in this uh, context uh, after uh, Ambassador Anil uh, has uh, highlighted some of the key issues uh, concerning India's energy security. Uh, you see, uh, the world produces uh, something like 100 million barrels of crude oil per day and uh, almost 28 to 30 million barrels uh, of oil uh, comes uh, from OPEC plus uh, countries in this uh, region of West Asia and uh, North uh, Africa. And uh, the most important consumer, of course, uh, uh, has been the United States, which uh, burns nearly 18 to 20 million barrels of oil every 24 hours. We are somewhere around uh, fourth or fifth uh, after China, European Union, uh, and other major uh, players. And uh, is it this oil uh, has been uh, a major uh, factor uh, in the West Asian region. Out of uh, the 25 countries in this region, you know, almost 15 countries. Uh, have major oil or gas reserves located in their uh, uh, sands from Iran, Iraq, the GCC countries of Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Oman. Plus, uh, you have Libya, Algeria, Sudan, uh, uh, and uh, Egypt uh, and Israel also have gas. Uh, along with uh, some oil deposits from Syria and uh, uh, Yemen. <clears throat> so put together something like 15 countries in West Asia and North Africa are uh, producing uh, oil and gas, uh, uh, which is uh, largely exported. And uh, we import, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, you know, bulk of our uh, requirements uh, uh, from this region and uh, beyond. <clears throat> And uh, why West Asia is important uh, for our energy security uh, is because of two, three factors. One is it is the uh, nearest point from where we can import oil and gas. The, the distance between India and the GCC countries of the Gulf region is the nearest where bulk of the oil resources, gas resources are uh, located. And these uh, uh, resources, crude oil and gas, have to be transported or tankers. Uh, and uh, transporting involves cost. The further you are from the source, the greater is the cost. So the cost-wise also, it is cheaper for us to import from the GCC countries uh, 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 and Iran and Iraq. The third one is uh, when you transport uh, oil and gas uh, uh, in tankers, uh, uh, you have to pay insurance. So the insurance cost also uh, is important uh, uh, when the actual price of energy is calculated. So insurance cost also would be uh, much less compared to the farther areas from Nigeria, the United States, or the Siberian area, Vladivostok for uh, Russia. So the transport cost, the insurance cost, uh, 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 all of these are calculated in the actual uh, price or uh, preference of uh, uh, the countries uh, why we import bulk of our energy from the Gulf uh, region. Also, uh, as I said, uh, this Gulf region has uh, huge resources. Two thirds of the world's oil and gas is located in the Gulf region. So uh, we need to procure from secure sources. We need long-term uh, arrangements for import of energy because of our dependence, growing dependence on energy. Uh, uh, so we have signed long-term agreements with uh, uh, Iraq, with Saudi Arabia, with Kuwait, with UAE, and uh, uh, other countries, Qatar, for example. So these long-term uh, uh, 
uh, agreements on uh, our energy requirement, both oil and gas, uh, you know, uh, uh, are important for stability uh, because uh, any disruption in the supply of uh, oil or gas uh, would disrupt our uh, transport, our developmental efforts, uh, so on and so forth. So we need to have long-term uh, agreements for the import of energy and from secure uh, sources. So in that way, uh, even though India is dependent on the Gulf countries uh, or the West Asian uh, countries, they are also uh, uh, important uh, sellers. They are interested in finding secure buyers. So India is an important buyer for uh, oil, like China has been, uh, or earlier the United States. So the Gulf countries also uh, uh, have been looking for secure partners so that they can sell uh, their uh, oil and gas. And India has emerged as a major importer uh, uh, of uh, oil and gas. Uh, along with this, uh, the relationship uh, between India and the uh, West Asian country is linked with other uh, issues uh, uh, which are connected with our energy, and that is uh, the trade. You know, we have uh, uh, deficient trade with all of these uh, oil importing countries. We buy more through oil uh, uh, from Saudi Arabia, but our exports are less. So we pay more in foreign exchange to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait, to Iraq, to UAE and other countries. So in that way, we need to uh, uh, export uh, to these countries uh, so that we have foreign exchange. Uh, then related to this also is the investments. These countries, uh, oil rich countries have uh, surplus dollars, surplus foreign currency, which they are looking for investment. And India is a major destination for uh, investments. Uh, uh, along with this, you have the Indian workers also, whose number is growing since 1973. Now it is nearly 9 million uh, workers uh, in the GCC countries alone. So if you put together all of these uh, uh, issues, uh, you know, there is a very strong bond between uh, India and the West Asian uh, countries, especially the Gulf countries, with whom we have long historical uh, ties, uh, uh, they share uh, uh, the culture, the cuisine, the uh, various aspects uh, in their individual uh, societal life uh, uh, for a long, long period uh, when they did not have oil, they were dependent on trade with uh, India. And, uh, you know, it is uh, the fact uh, well known that uh, uh, the maturity of ties is reflected uh, in the uh, bond, uh, strong bond which India has with uh, many of these uh, countries. So the recent incident, uh, I would see that as a storm and passing cloud. Uh, and as you can witness, uh, immediately the Iranian foreign minister uh, came to India and uh, met with the foreign minister and the prime minister which goes to show that uh, Iran being an important regional power uh, in the Gulf region, you know, views this as a passing incident, uh, which of course has to be addressed. I'll come to that in the end. But uh, it shows how important uh, ties are uh, uh, for Iran with India, just as uh, Indian diplomacy uh, became active uh, to repair the damage done uh, in the recent past uh, 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 by taking numerous uh, steps. You see, the, uh, the issue of uh, importing of oil and gas from this region uh, is uh, a compulsion for us because of uh, our developmental needs, because of lack of our own domestic sources of oil and uh, gas. But we have been trying to uh, explore uh, uh, oil and gas from uh, many partners in this region. You must have heard about the idea of importing of uh, Iranian gas for over 25 years. The Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline, uh, which was supposed to take shape. But due to various reasons, including the American sanctions on Iran and the conflictual relations between India and Pakistan and the uh, 
uh, security situation in Baluchistan and various other issues have dodged this uh, pipeline and uh, we are yet to see the like uh, of the day. Similar is the fate of the TAPI, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, because Turkmenistan is one of the major oil and gas producing country particularly, and uh, India has been uh, working uh, to bring Turkmen gas uh, through Afghanistan to India. But as you know, the turmoil in Afghanistan has affected uh, this pipeline uh, project. Uh, uh, and uh, although efforts are being made, but it is unlikely that uh, we would get uh, in the near future either uh, the Turkmen gas or the Iranian gas or even the Bangladeshi gas or the Myanmar gas for various geopolitical uh, uh, reasons and also uh, the global uh, powers intervention uh, in one way or the other. Now there are uh, attempts to build a pipeline between Iran and Oman so that Iranian gas can be exported to Oman and from there, Oman becomes a major uh, exporter of uh, Iranian gas uh, uh, to the world. Uh, hopefully, we may also get uh, gas through uh, Oman, uh, Iranian gas through Oman. See, uh, all of these uh, factors are uh, relevant, but uh, uh, the, 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 the utter dependency in which we have landed ourselves uh, uh, also indicates that we need to redouble our efforts to uh, uh, work for the renewables. You know, we have been talking for the last 25 plus years, we have a ministry in charge of these renewables, but uh, 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 the, the progress has not been really satisfactory. We talk about nuclear energy, we talk about uh, solar energy, we talk about uh, thermal energy, Hydro, uh, elect hydropower, electricity, so on and so forth. Uh, so in that way, uh, uh, we need to redouble our efforts. You know, a small country like Norway, you know, where 50% uh, of the cars are now electric cars, or Sweden or Finland. So in that way, the innovation and the technology needed, uh, uh, we need to uh, redouble the investments and uh, see to it that the renewables uh, uh, are uh, taking shape in a concrete uh, manner. Uh, although the demand is huge for a country of continental size of uh, India, uh, but uh, it is important that we give uh, sufficient funds uh, for the uh, renewables and uh, uh, other aspects uh, which would uh, uh, not make us vulnerable uh, to some of the issues involved in the Gulf region because uh, we have had several oil shocks uh, from this region because of uh, domestic turmoil there, revolutions, wars, uh, uh, instability, foreign intervention, coups, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, from 73 to the Iranian revolution, the Iran-Iraq war, the Kuwait crisis, uh, sanctions on Iraq and various other uh, issues uh, have affected uh, uh, supplies from oil, uh, oil supplies, raised eyebrows uh, or raised um, prices. And of course, our own developmental efforts uh, uh, also have been affected uh, uh, because of the instability there. So overall, uh, what is uh, important is uh, Mm, taking a lesson from the recent crisis uh, uh, involving the BJP spokesman with Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and a host of countries, both in West Asia and uh, in Southeast Asia. We need to be very careful uh, uh, in pursuing policies which would damage, affect, because all of these uh, countries are Islamic countries. Uh, uh, Islamic people are sensitive and uh, Islamic uh, groups are very active uh, in these countries. Uh, so uh, a situation may uh, go out of hand for these rulers also, you know, because of the large number of uh, Indians there. We have heard about the boycott of Indian products in uh, Kuwait uh, or workers of a particular community. 
like we had during the Babri Masjid in the early 90s issue. So these situations uh, need to be avoided. Uh, we need to follow an inclusive policy domestically without uh, showing favor or discrimination to one community or the other. Because the whole world is watching India as a successful democracy, as an emerging economy, as a aspirant uh, global, aspiring global power to become a member of the UN Security Council or an important player in the BRICS uh, or non-aligned movement, or as a nuclear power, how responsible we are. So for all of these uh, things, you know, we need to pursue uh, secure, uh, sound domestic policies, inclusive policy and uh, rule of law, respect uh, for uh, all the religions and communities. You know, when electoral politics uh, takes an upper hand and uh, one-upmanship, uh, uh, takes precedence, you know, these kind of uh, incidents go out of hand and they cause uh, potential damage to the country's uh, uh, relations. And uh, West Asia being a very important uh, component because if you put all the Islamic countries of 57 members of the OIC, that block constitutes the largest trading block, more than 150 billion uh, of India's trade would be with this uh, block of OIC countries. So we cannot afford to antagonize or alienate ourselves from the uh, Islamic world, uh, uh, especially the Gulf countries, uh, which are very important uh, uh, from uh, all points of view. Uh, I would uh, stop here and uh, uh, see what are the issues which need to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For your, for your valuable and insightful views on India and West Asia relations. It's, uh, it's indeed, as I told earlier, it's very important for India to balance and also to continue the good relations with the West Asian countries, where it is all uh, more majority of the Indian energy. It's relied on uh, GCC countries. So in this regard, I want to uh, request uh, Dr. Binod, uh, Dr. Binod, what do you do? You want to say anything? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I just it was very enlightening to listen to viewpoints of uh, Professor Eki Pasha finally, and before that, Ambassador Neil. I, I didn't find any disagreement between two of them, but uh, Professor Pasha did reminded us that uh, it's a very delicate situation, and India has to maintain a peaceful and stable. I mean, extended. <laughs> relationship with the extended neighborhood, you know, that is GCC, a huge trading block with India. But since we live in, in a global uh, community where uh, India's geographical location is very uh, important, whether it, we look towards east or towards west, I'm not very really clear that uh, in this ratio, Ukraine war, the Gulf countries are a real winner or losers. I mean, in terms of this energy business or overall politics, because there's no, there are no comments from their side. They're, they're not choosing any side. There's no any debate. There's a lot of pressure on India to choose a side. But the, this uh, Af Afro Asian other countries here, they're basically, are they going with uh, um, Russia or they're just maintaining the old enough, you know, neutral, non aligned stand? And uh, I have listened to some of the comments of Professor Neil uh, to that uh, maybe it's another chance for India. To lead, uh, you know, NAM 2.0, something like we don't choose a side, and uh, we again be emerge as a leader of these countries, which are not going to choose a side in any uh, geopolitical war. So this was a point where I wanted Anil sir to just, uh, uh, because okay. we are not sure that we'll repeat NAM 2.0. But sir, your experience, what do you say? Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, you know, the thing is, uh, the world is really shifting gears at this moment especially after the Russia-US war. I do not call it Russia-Ukraine war. It is between Russia and USA. This is a war which has changed the whole gamut how the wars are fought. Here, you are seeing a weaponization of the financial instruments of the West against Russia, which is the most, uh, I would say, sanctioned country in the world today. This is the first time that you are seeing that a country's foreign exchange reserves of $630 billion Blocked. are confiscated. Yeah. What does it say 
I mean, there are umpteen number of sanctions and all. Russia cannot be dished away because it is the largest country in the world. It is the richest country in the world. And so even if they want to, it is difficult to completely uh, sideline them. That's not possible. So what are they looking at? They are looking at totally subjugating it. And in order to counter that, what is Russia looking at? Russia is looking at alternate mechanism, whether it is financial architecture with China, with certain other countries. And US is trying very hard to keep its flock together in the West, which is unlikely. If it can, war continues for three more months, it will be very difficult for Americans to keep the European allies together. Because in those democracies, you will have major problems at the grassroots level. You must be reading that just in a few months' time, UK has the lowest ever standard of living in the history after the Second World War. All these countries, including the US, are having the highest ever inflation. Yes. So those people cannot. So, so in this situation, what are we looking at? We are looking at the world getting divided into two blocks, like it happened post Second World War. It is Cold War 2.0, you may call it, or Hot War 2.0, whatever it is. But given the way the things are today, this is where it is heading. And this will be a different kind of, a, it will not be political alone. Earlier one was more political ideological, but this one is going to be far more economic centric because China is the behemoth and the dragon in the world, which they want to contain, very difficult to do so also. So the best is to some extent confused, but it is giving way. Now in that situation, what happens to countries like India? I mean, you have forever, when you, you were very weak after the independence, then you chose a path that we will take views, we are not neutral, but we will take an opinion on the basis of the merits of the particular case and which should be in our own interest. That's precisely what we are looking at. So today when we are members of the Quad, we are also continuing to be the members of the BRICS and we chair last year, you know, we chaired the BRICS. We are the members of the RIC. We are also the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with China. But while we are uh, going ahead with the uh, the new economic quad, or for that matter, the uh, whatever the Americans have launched, IPEF and other things. So we have a global comprehensive strategic partnership with the Americans. At the same time, we have a special and privileged partnership with the Russians. Our problem is China. And when it comes to China, then obviously India will have to. So we cannot take sides just like that. And we are far too big for that. And that's when Dr. Jashankar says that we have to look at our own interests. We can think ourselves what we want. So that's why when I say that this is the right time, because at this time, Africa, large part of Asia, large part of Latin America, want the same thing which India wants, a strategic autonomy. They don't want to be living under any hegemony. So that's why I always say that we could try now. This will be the right time in a few months' time for us to look at some kind of a grouping called Nations for a Strategic Autonomy. And that's, that, that's what I meant. So it, time has to come because you are the third largest economy. You're going to be the largest population in the world. You, have, you are the largest democracy irrespective of whatever weak, uh, weaknesses we have. But no, nobody can deny that. So when we have all that, then we need to work on it. You are a nuclear power, you are a space power. I mean, what do you need? Uh, Master Sir, uh, uh, since I lived in China uh, for more than a decade and I was a teacher there, Sir, on the public platform, India is well respected and well, uh, I mean, preserved. But Sir, in the chat rooms, in the social media chat rooms or in the behind, when Sir, you yourself speaks many languages, I also understand Mandarin. So it's very hard, you know, we lose the self-respect of India, the words they use for India in the chat rooms on any issue, on global issues, that you know, in China, they call us a kind of a third party, you know, not siding with any party in the history, even now. So Americans, again, they are not saying anything directly, but in their chat rooms, you know, they're using all the bad words. Sometimes the Biden is sharing, calling us shaky, you know. So um, my, my question to you, sir, as a diplomat, as a student, foreign students in different countries, how do we uh, maintain our self-respect of India? You cannot maintain your self-respect by subjugating yourself to the Americans or to the Chinese. 
It's not possible. I mean, do you think we'll do ourselves a service if we were we became a part of their uh, US-led bloc? Will, will you have greater respect at the time? Americans use you like a plastic and throw it away. As simple as that. You are, they, every other country for them is a part of the chess game. You are a rook, not even a queen or a, any major, you know. So you cannot, how you can leverage yourself? The idea is you can leverage yourself because you have the market. That's what I tell even the oil producing countries. If you produce oil, you can't drink it. You got to sell it. Who's going to buy it? Yes. Americans, if they make weapons, they have to sell it. Russia, if it makes weapons. So we are the buyers. We need to dictate the terms. And that's why I say we should also try to create a, some kind of oil importing and consuming countries cartel like the OPEC. Why not? Have those kind of things. So when you are a non, I mean, when you are not aligned with any country in an alliance format, then you can dictate the terms. And even in the Russia-Ukraine war, I believe firmly that we have taken a principled stand. It is not a stand for Russia or for against America. It is a principled stand which now everybody is beginning to understand. And that's why you have more respect from 100. I mean, I would not be, this is not a place to say that, but I tell you for the first time in the history of India's uh, engagement, Yoga day, we talk it as very likely you may be taking it, but 177 countries, including all Muslim countries, supported the yoga day. That is your strength. That's your power. China will always berate you. Americans will always berate you. And there is a theory that this, whatever happened in the, the reaction that came from uh, the Middle East this time was more uh, uh, possibly uh, also nudged by the Americans. Yes, sir. Because of our stand. So there has been a theory like that. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I believe that if we have done the wrong thing, we need to have the courage to accept it. And we have done that. So I think that in that sense, I am a firm believer. I may be wrong totally, but I think that we need to find our own feet. So it was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Ma'am, can you ask the questions in the chat, chat box? Yeah, uh, let me weigh in just briefly on this issue. You see, uh, the Russia Ukraine. Uh, Conflict, I see it as an important landmark in global politics. And uh, my own impression is that, uh, you see, uh, this is a pointer to an emerging multipolar world. And uh, India is a major player, uh, is going to be a major player in the emerging uh, uh, world order comprising of uh, China, Japan, India, uh, the BRIC countries of South Africa, Brazil, including Iran, Turkey, and uh, plus the old order of European Union and the United States and the Canadians and Australians. So in that way, uh, you see, if you see uh, the West Asian countries, particularly the oil and gas countries, you know, they were under tremendous pressure from the United States and the European Union to increase the oil production, the gas production. You know, what we are seeing in Europe, uh, high, very high energy cost, oil and gas, is because of the sanctions they have slapped on uh, Russia. And they expected the Arab and other countries to come to their rescue, but they have refused. Saudi Arabia refused to increase the oil production. Qatar refused to increase the gas production. Uh, so is the case with other countries. So in that way, even those countries which are uh, allies or dependent on the United States, they are uh, not willing to tow the American line. You know the utter dependence of Saudi Arabia and UAE and Bahrain and other GCC countries uh, on America for security. But uh, they have now mustered courage to say no on the core issue because they see what Russia is doing is in their long-term interest. They don't want the uh, uh, pressure on Russia uh, to succeed because it may happen uh, on their own countries, like it is being hap uh, happening in the case of uh, Iran. So in that way, India's position uh, on the Ukraine crisis, uh, I think, uh, is a clear pointer, is a message not only to China, to Russia, but also to the European Union and the United States that, look, India is going to be a major player, it will decide not because it is a member of Quad or because uh, it is a democracy and it should share the democratic values with the Europeans, 
but because of our long term uh, interest so in that way we are nudging uh, slowly uh, towards an order where uh, we will have uh, sufficiently uh, strong place to argue for we have been knocking the doors of the five permanent members for a seat in the un security council the united states has promised umpteen number of times britain france all the other countries but when it comes to actual reforms in the un they slide back they don't want india to have a veto wielding power they say we will accommodate you as non veto wielding power we don't want that kind of situation so in that way the global economic situation also is uh, revolving towards a situation where uh, the dictates of the west particularly led by the united states uh, is not so much a factor uh, now you know in most of the writings uh, you know you, in the in the social media you might uh, come across sarcastic remarks from the united states or the europeans but it shows their utter frustration they are frustrated that india is uh, able to say no to them they expected uh, us to toe the line because they thought that uh, we are dependent on them because of china because of uh, various other factor but no we are capable of saying no uh, uh, to them and we know the actual situation what uh, uh, is happening in the, you know, in the united states you know Um, you know way back in 95 uh, or 98 uh, one of our prime minister you know in a press conference uh, in uh, egypt had referred to the united kingdom as not even a 10th rate power 25 years ago so as ambassador anil pointed out uh, the standard of living in uk has come down and it is coming down because of their own stupid policies they want to dictate terms and dominate the world they are refusing to accept other centers of power whether it is china or india or turkey or iran or nigeria or brazil or south africa these are the new voices which are emerging and uh, india is taking the lead uh, in uh, this situation uh, uh, and i think uh, you should ignore all this chat room insinuations and uh, tell them you know, boldly and frankly and uh, categorically that look no matter what you say it uh, reflects your uh, frustration and your inability to put your own house in uh, order i think there is no need for despondency thank you sir uh, thank you sir for your uh, incredible discussion sir it is a really indeed it is required for us and uh, we should have an uh, uh, positive thinking regarding the relations between india and west asia in connection with this sir uh, recently west asian countries and russia uh, you, you know they are regularly uh, imposing uh, sanctions on each other sir uh, sir yes yeah, so for me will it uh, yeah, impact on uh, india's relations with west asia sir in future no who is imposing uh, sanctions i don't think russia is imposing sanctions on west asia it is that the americans who are imposing the sanctions on russia and on iran and other west asian countries like uh, sudan libya syria yemen you know on, on every other country they impose sanctions uh, and uh, that is affecting uh, our diplomacy also in one way or the other yes sir thank you sir and uh, once again with having a you know, hopes to improve the relations and to remove uh, resolve all that sen- uh, tensions in between india and west asia to hope for better relations sir uh, you know with this i will continue uh, the discussion sir with our students some of our students are very eager to know more information regarding the india and west asia and india's energy security sir uh, now i will call uh, alok uh, to ask the question sir he is having a question sir he is studying in the final year sir good afternoon everyone and uh, thank you sir for enlightening us with your immense knowledge sir my question is uh, do indian enjoy human rights uh, while working and living in west asia yes of course they have their uh, human rights otherwise uh, 
if the if the rights were not respected why would they go in large numbers there and work that is the basic point you see human dignity is very important uh, for any individual you know indians uh, of course uh, uh labor class has been going there blue collar workers have been going there for the last uh, uh 40 years plus uh, but uh, uh, there are uh, cases uh, where you know especially uh, maid servants and uh, construction workers uh, you know have not got adequate uh, uh, accommodation or uh, their passports are seized or they are made to work uh, unduly for long hours uh, you know this uh, applies to other uh, countries uh, immigrant labor also it is uh, it is not special to indian workers you know uh, workers from pakistan from afghanistan from philippines bangladesh also uh, face a similar situation but uh, uh, indian embassies indian government uh, leaders have been from time to time intervening in this situation and uh, wherever there is a uh, uh, sign of violation of their rights especially the right to contract uh, their salaries uh, uh, and various other issues uh, uh, we have taken strict action uh, and i think uh, by and large uh, it has been to the satisfaction of both the uh, countries you know international uh, groups ngos try to rake up this issue whether it is uh, in qatar or in kuwait uh, so on and so forth uh, uh, there are uh, cases uh, of violation of human rights individual cases uh, but that should not be generalized you know if you see the number of indian workers uh, it has been steadily rising since 73 you know it is not just 100 200 3000 but uh, hundreds and thousands almost 85 lakh 85 lakh indian workers are gainfully employed they hold lucrative posts billions of dollars are paid as salaries to them and they support almost 50 million indian worker indians in india this uh, f- uh, 9 million near in 9 million support their fathers their mothers their children their grand grandfathers and grandmothers and in a big way in more than 16 countries from kerala to tamil nadu to karnataka goa maharashtra gujarat rajasthan bihar up you know west bengal all of these uh, host uh, have sent workers to the gcc countries and uh, they uh, send back their uh, salaries almost uh, a major part of it very few have taken their families to stay with them because the requirement there is very high so in that way bulk of the salaries earned by the indian workers they are sent back and it uh, uh, it fuels the uh, economic development here uh, the the worker uh, if he sends uh, even 2 lakhs uh, in a month it helps the uh, the families the children's education you know uh, uh, and uh, economic living whether they buy the house or property or investment uh, or travel or education all this uh, money comes back into our uh, economy so uh, if he was not uh, happy there or if his uh, human rights were violated he would not stay it is uh, as simple as that human dignity is more important uh, uh, some some amount of uh, uh, restriction on the freedom uh, is uh, Uh, accepted including uh, in india the supreme court uh, imposes certain reasonable restrictions on the uh, fundamental rights it is not uh, uh, you know absolute so in that way uh, there are uh, issues but uh, these are far and uh, few in the overall context i'll just add as one thing for your information is that uh, with all these countries we have uh regular institutional mechanisms agreements are signed and every time there is an effort is made that wherever there is a problem for somebody there are insurance packages for them so that they don't suffer if their jobs are immediately taken out they are not paid salary so every year i think we have tremendous changes that are taking place in improving the conditions of our people one small thing i want to tell you in qatar for example during the pandemic 
in India, that may not be so, but there Indians are roughly about three times of the Qatari population. And when it came to vaccination, there was no distinction whether you are an Indian or you are a Pakistani or you are a Qatari. So everybody was given uh, the same Moderna or Pfizer vaccines. <clears throat> that shows uh, that they are taking it, take, taking full care. And if you are suffering from this, then immediately they were provided the same kind of assistance. <clears throat> yeah, I totally agree with the ambassador. In fact, uh, we have signed agreements with most of the GCC countries for issues to be resolved in the courts. And they have agreed uh, the local courts take up uh, expeditiously all the cases related to uh, non-payment of salaries or sacking of the workers or violation of the contracts so on and so forth. Of course, there are some exceptions, uh, which applies to all the immigrant population. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But don't go by the TV and press comments which try to exaggerate one or two stray cases here and there. You have to be very careful uh, uh, not to be carried away by uh, including the Indian news channels, which tend to exaggerate uh, beyond uh, uh, proportion. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your... Uh, uh you know, kind uh, answers to our student. Sir, we have uh, uh, questions in the chat box, sir. Uh, one, on, one on Iran, I'll just tell you uh, an interesting question. Uh, well, you know that when uh, the Americans put the sanctions earlier, there were certain waivers that were granted to India. Even during the Trump time, we got certain waiver, but then they told us that they are not going to allow, but they will arrange the replacement of the oil from there and eventually because of several Indian companies, it was not because of the government. The Indian companies who are importing the oil, they decided that they will rather not import because they will have sanctions across the world because still today, the financial system is totally controlled by the Americans. We had the Iranian foreign minister and I understand that there have been discussions on this once again. He told us what is happening on the uh, joint comprehensive plan of action, which is called the uh, Iran nuclear deal with the US and all. And uh, the hopes are uh, that uh, this deal will be signed in, in some time and then we'll, have, we'll be importing from the oil. We are ready to do that. India has been working on it for quite some time now, actually, uh, to as soon as possible to import the Iranian oil because we have certain refineries which are actually made for those. So this is uh, how I look at it today. And uh, the other one uh, was uh, uh, how internal politics of India influences the India foreign relations specific for security energy. Well, as we, we had told both Professor Pasha and I spoke about this, uh, this is something which should not happen, as simple as that. The, the, the state to state political problems can be resolved. But the problem which impact at the grassroots level, the people, that is something which is a bit difficult because perceptions then are made. This time we have been able to manage it, but if we continue to have those kind of problems, they will impact on our uh, Indian uh, people who are living there in those countries. Professor Pasha. Yes, just one or two short points. Uh, you see on Iran, uh, my take is that, uh, you see, uh, we have unnecessarily come under uh, uh, the influence or pressure from the United States, like China and Russia and Turkey and other countries, you know, we should have uh, told the Americans that, uh, you know, for our energy security, Iran is extremely important. Uh, and uh, we should have com continued to import oil and gas, uh, even if it were in a limited uh, quantity, uh, to show that uh, the importance of Iran in our energy uh, mix. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, even now, when if the JCPOA is signed, uh, we need to make it very clear that, uh, you know, of course, the GCC countries are important, but to balance them, we need to have a robust uh, energy relationship with uh, Iran in the long term, because uh, Iran has huge reserves of uh, gas and also oil, which are important for our energy security. In that way, uh, we can have uh, a balanced relationship with the West Asian countries. Uh, uh, regarding the other issue, you see, uh, as I pointed out, uh, the BJP government uh, should realize that, uh, you know, 
the inclusive policy is extremely important because uh, as all the BJP leaders and others point out, India has the second or third largest Muslim population. And uh, any mistreatment or statement uh, towards them would impact the Muslim masses in the Islamic countries. Because uh, except uh, Israel, all the countries in West Asia have large uh, Muslim population and some are Islamic countries or Islamic republics. So in that way, you know, for the last eight years, uh, what was happening because of uh, electoral politics or Hindu Twa politics or whatever, you know, these kind of issues uh, are not merely confined within the borders of India. Through the news channels, through social media, through electronic media, print media, this is read and watched uh, in the Islamic countries also very carefully, especially where you have large Indian population uh, there. So any incitement through the TV channels or the media or press uh, would naturally impact the population because you know, in West Asia, you have various Islamic movements emerging from time to time, right uh, from the rise of Islam. You have several extreme uh, movements within Islam, which are more conservative, orthodox, emerging, whether it is Wahhabism or Salafism or Ikhwan al muslimin or Islamic State, and in numerous groups uh, which are... Uh, uh, bent upon uh, going back to the period of Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago. They see all uh, these policies by the present rulers as aberrations and deviations from the pristine uh, Islamic uh, policy they should follow. And including the Islamic revolution in Iran, you know, it is, uh, it is a fact of life uh, nobody can deny for the last uh, four decades or so. So in that way, uh, the Islamic groups are very active there. Uh, like you have uh, the Hindu groups there, which also feel uh, uh, emboldened because of the rise of BJP. So in that way, one should uh, be cautious uh, what we do, because it will impact uh, not only bilateral relations, but also our economic uh, relations. So in that way, respect to the constitution, respect uh, uh, to the rule of law and democratic principles uh, in India would uh, showcase that we are a progressive uh, democracy uh, uh, that uh, includes all the people, whether Muslims, Hindus, Christians, uh, Sikh, or whatever, you know, which is what uh, we aspire to do through the constitution and uh, various measures uh, which we have taken since uh, independence. So in that way, an inclusive policy, respect for rule of law and respect to all minorities, uh, 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 and their belief system without attempts to isolate uh, and denigrate them, you know, is uh, very important in that context. Sir, thank you, sir, for your uh, uh, insightful and, uh, you know, concern about uh, uh, India and about your worry also, sir. I hope it will not, whatever the tensions are going on, uh, it will not impact on India's and India's uh, relations with West Asian countries, sir. It will not remain for a long time. And uh, with this, uh, one of my students is also waiting eagerly to ask a question, sir. He is having a question, sir. Uh, Ms. Ba Mr. Batu. Good evening, sir. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your valuable knowledge with us. This is Batur Arsalan from Afghanistan, a student at the Department of International Relations, Maharaja's College, University of Mysore. Sir, what is the importance and benefit of Tapi gas pipeline project for India, which is also key priority of India and Turkmenistan as well? And what is Indian government strategy for future to meet energy security? You see, we are looking for gas from every available source. And as I pointed out in my presentation, Turkmenistan has huge gas reserves. You know, they are exporting uh, gas to many countries, including China. And uh, we have signed agreements, we have been working, but the main issue is stability in your country. Your leader should uh, uh, work for peace, security, stability, and follow an inclusive policy. Why no country has recognized the Taliban government? Because uh, what they pursue is not acceptable to your neighbors, to your own friends. 
whether it is uh, China or Pakistan or Turkey or Russia or any other country. So the Taliban have to see uh, uh, why the world is boycotting them, why it doesn't want to have diplomatic relations. So stability in Afghanistan is extremely important because the pipeline has to go through large areas of Afghanistan. It will benefit Afghanistan. Afghanistan also would get gas uh, from Turkmenistan, which it uh, uh, can use for generating electricity for uh, industrial purposes, so on and so forth. But bulk of it will be used uh, in India and Pakistan. So in that way, the prosperity of all of these four countries uh, is linked to what the Taliban leaders do. The whole world has been trying to tell them that, look, you need to open your eyes. You need to uh, give freedom to women. You need to provide stability. You need to follow a policy which is acceptable, not only to your people, but to your neighbors and to the whole world. You know, we cannot live in an isolated world. We cannot live in the cages, uh, Tora Bora uh, caves, uh, as the Taliban leadership used to live there. You know, they have to. Uh, look for the aspiration of the people uh, like you, young people who want better education, better jobs uh, uh, in the Afghan uh, economy, so on and so forth. Uh, you want to go back to Afghanistan and teach or work or develop your country. So for that, uh, you need a policy, broad-based policy, which is uh, uh, inclusive and uh, helpful so that uh, your country gets the necessary technical input, financial input, support, and cooperation, which is extremely important. And in that context, Tapi gas uh, would be a major uh, factor, uh, which will provide stability and uh, economic development for all of these uh, countries. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, for your uh, fruitful and discussion, sir, I hope uh, uh, our students are enlightening and sir it is too much sir we are taking lot of time but one more question sir lastly uh, Chandan is a first year student he is uh, he is also eagerly waiting to uh, get to know more answers from you sir uh, Chandan so good evening sir uh, sir uh, so uh, India is now making use with Russia for oil imports, uh, but Russia has the largest na uh, natural gas reserves also in the world. What's the possibility of India importing gas from Russia, sir? Well, we have you see, yeah. sorry. sorry, Ambassador Anil, please go ahead. We have, we have received certain consignments of oil and gas from Russia, but uh, what is happening is you need pipelines. So those are the things that the, the, or LNG in that format. So what happens to the oil? Oil can be supplied through exchanges, you know, like what we have invested a great deal in Russian oil fields. So whatever oil we get from there that is traded and that is we buy here and then it is an exchange for that. But for the gas, it has to be either LNG or the pipe gas. So there are discussions going on on that field exactly how it can work out. Getting gas through the uh, tankers is expensive because uh, the LNG conversion of liquefied natural gas uh, uh, in bringing through huge tankers is an expensive proposition. You must have terminals uh, uh, and the Russians also should have the technology in, in their ports in the eastern part. But bulk of their uh, oil, sorry, gas is uh, committed to Europe. And uh, I'm not very sure if uh, on a long-term basis like Qatar, they would be willing to sign agreements uh, uh, with India. We would be very much looking for gas, but uh, we have other uh, areas. I think uh, Israel also is emerging as uh, one of the important uh, players in the gas field in the coming years. And once sanctions are removed on Iran, hopefully Iranian gas also, if the technology of LNG is uh, available, we hope to get uh, from the nearest port because from uh, Chabahar or Bandar Abbas or any other terminal from Iran, you know, to uh, Dobal in Gujarat, that is the nearest point uh, through which the LNG tankers can uh, come apart from Qatar, uh, on which we have become dependent and uh, we saw the nasty situation over the last uh, two weeks. So in that way, if we have more opportunity, whether it is Turkmen gas or Iranian gas or Russian gas, 
or uh, other sources, you know, we can avoid uh, this kind of a situation uh, in uh, future. So in that way, we need to work uh, to reduce the tensions and bring quietly uh, the peace and security and uh, bilateral relationship. We should play our own role in the nuclear deal also behind the scene. Thank you, sir. Thank you for both of you, sir. You made us to feel as we are in the classroom, sir. Uh, Masha, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Now, given a wonderful discussion, a wonderful explanation, information for us, sir. And with this, sir, uh, I would like to say, sir, uh, India is required to put more effort to become a self-reliant in coming days, sir. And also, it should think about the relations, how it can maintain the balanced relations with uh, West Asian countries, because it's very important for India. And also, you know, without entering into any uh, other uh, organization, and uh, uh, it should have its own stand in this uh, uh, global world or in this challenging world order, sir. And uh, sir, we also have an, a formal procedure to give an, a vote of thanks, sir. I request uh, one of my students, Sayeli, to offer an, a vote of thanks, sir. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, good evening to all. It's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of my department. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Professor K.S. Rangappa, sir, former Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore and Karnataka State Open University for his special presence. Thank you so much, sir, for your encouraging opening remarks. I would also like to thank Ambassador Anil Triganayat, sir, former Ambassador of India to Libya and distinguished fellow in Vivekananda International Foundation for sharing his knowledge with us. We are extremely happy to hear your views on India's energy security and West Asia. I'm happy to extend my sincere thanks to Professor K. S. Pasha, uh, Director of CR India, ex-associate dean, director and chairman of uh, School of International Studies, J JNU, for gracing this event. So we are really privileged that we got the chance to hear your vision. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. A special thanks to Dr. Apaji Gora, sir, for his special presence. Uh, we are really lucky that despite of the busy schedule, all the speakers found the time to grace this event. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to Mysore Global Forum for giving us this opportunity. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the faculty members of our department, dignitaries, students, scholars who have joined this seminar, the people who work behind the screen and the students of IR department for making this event a successful one. Before ending, I would like to inform you that a recorded version of this seminar will be available in our YouTube channel. And also, I'm glad to announce that next week we have another panel discussion on the topic of India's cultural diplomacy in the digital world. Once again, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, we look forward to get you, you know, again and also keep posted your Twitter and YouTube channels. We really want to follow you. Thank and you. Uh, your yeah. viewers very giving us self-confidence, no doubt. But sir, Professor Pasha, being a student, JNU, JNU give me one minute. Uh, I, I really feel that when I went to Gulf countries and China, I believe that those people who have lived in Indian democracy, it's a little hard for them to survive in those autocracies. Uh, Professor Pasha, that's what my personal experience was. They have their own standard and their rule of law. But you know, once you have lived in India where you're allowed to speak your mind and debate you know, unending in the JNU Ganga Dhaba, then you go to China or go to Russia, even and go to the country, you have very difficult time. So- Yes, there is, there is a choice. Uh, you can continue to go to Ganga Dhaba, don't go to Gulf countries and China, <laughs> stay back and enjoy the chai or meal at the Ganga Dhaba. Enjoy the democracy, forget about the money making. <laughs> Sir, always, uh, sir, thank you, sir, uh, Ambassador Anil Triganya. Thank, thank you. Pasha, thank you. Professor Pasha, sir, always uh, has been a uh, motivating for us, especially for me, and uh, making our discussions so fruitful. I hope all the students and those who gathered here and were here and virtually, they are benefited. And uh, especially while talking about Professor Pasha, always he will be advising me. And he is a former uh, uh, founder, chairperson of our department, sir, uh, board of study. Sir, uh, Anil, sir, 
you are most welcome to mysore sir pasha sir is there. always sir is uh, guiding me because of him i could uh, able to uh, bring all these uh, discussions uh, today whatever we are at is that credit goes to professor pasha sir sir uh, once again warm welcome to you sir thank you thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you for all your efforts see you soon